Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide to 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to any one of these problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of redoing the problems. Yesterday, on day number 360, yesterday was our day number 360, yesterday we finished redoing all the 174 data sufficiency questions number 174 of the data sufficiency questions we did yet we did yesterday on day number 360 the information is still on the blackboard from yesterday the project began day number 252 the very first day of redoing the, the data sufficiency questions that project began on December 4th of 2013 and yesterday was March 1st 2014. So it took us about three months, but uh, but but it's done. They are all there. The redo that is of 174 data sufficiency questions. But we still have not finished the problem solving questions. There are 230 of them, and we are at about 200 right now. We have about 30 more to go, which means in about 10 more days, we'll be finished with the data sufficiency questions as well, which means the whole project will be finished at day number 370. Today is our day number 361. 361 and we are on page number 181. Please start to it. The very first problem on the page is 181. Problem number 203. Problem number 203. It tells us that the current price of a towel is certain amount. Let's keep, let's call it P dollars. P for the price. We are told that at that price, n towels, n towels can be had for one hundred and twenty dollars. So whatever the prevailing price is of the towels in this particular shop, we are told that at that particular price, we can buy n towels, again an unknown quantity, if we have $120. $120 will buy us n towels. The question is this, if, if price were to go up, by a dollar, if the price were to go up by a dollar, ten fewer, ten fewer can be bought for one hundred and twenty dollars. The question is, how much is P? That's what we want to find out. We want to find out. The question here is, so what is the current price right now, given the fact that if we were to raise the price by one dollar, if the price were to raise by one dollar, by a dollar, then we'll buy, we, able to, we will be able to buy ten fewer dollars. Listen, before, first thing first, before we, go, before we dive into the math, mathematical solution of the problem, let's, let me get us, uh, something out of my system here so that it's out of my system and I feel better. If price, price is singular, if price is singular, why were? Why do we say were? I'm doing this thing for the benefit of the non-native speakers right now because if you're a speaker of the English language, hopefully you will understand it. It is were is because one of the idiosyncrasies, one of the one of the uh, one of the eccentric, eccentric uh, quality of the English language. The rule in English language is that if if one is if one is speaking hypothetically, then one is to use were since this is hypothetical situation. If we were to, it's not real, but. Suppose that we did raise the price by one dollar. That's what they're saying here. If we were, it's, it's a hypo it is were because it is hypothetical. It is a hypothetical situation. If it's a hypothetical situation, if I were rich, 
if I were rich, I would of course buy a Yugo. For those of you who know what a Yugo wo was, not is, it no longer exists. Uh, anyway, so that was it. Listen, let's, let's solve the problem. I've been talking too much. There are two ways we can go about solving the problem. Okay, listen very carefully. There are two ways we can go, go about solving the problem. One way is the smart way, economical way, quick way. And that's the way, of course, we're going to do in the real exam. Because in the real exam, the name of the game is to keep on moving. Which is to understand that there are five answer choices. These are the nature of the problem. Listen very carefully. The nature of the problem is such that the answer here, whatever it is, is numerical. If they ask you what is the price or how old is Michael or, or how much was the house sold for, the nature of these questions is such that the answers are going to be numerical. And whenever the answer choices are numerical, whenever the answer choices are numerical in these questions, they are always arranged. In this case, it is 1, 2, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 12. Whenever the answer choices are numerical, like I said, listen carefully. Whenever the answer choices are numerical, as they are here, they are always arranged either in the ascending order or in descending order. Either in increasing order or in the decreasing order. They are never mixed up. They are never mixed up if, they are num if the answers are numerical. Well, what we have to understand here is that the correct answer to this problem, whatever it is, has to be one of these fives. Has to be one of these fives. Why don't we just pick one and put it in the problem and see if it works, see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, try something else. My question to you is that if you were to do that trial and error method, what do you suppose in the worst case situation, how many times do you suppose we'll end up trying? There is a way of figuring out the correct answer here by trying only twice, only twice. Not four times, if you said four times, not four times, not five times, only by trying twice we can locate the right answer. And the key is this, the key is to always start with the happy medium. Always start with the happy medium. If C works, if C fits, great, you get lucky. There's a one or five chance that you might get lucky and C is the answer, it fits, it, it's fine. Everything is hunky-dory, as we say in the desert. If, if C does not fit, then in most cases, in most cases, you should be able to tell whether that amount is too large or too small. If it turns out that 3 is too large, Try, to try either a 2 or a 1. So next time around you try 2. If 2 fits, you're done. The answer is B. If it turns out that 2 is still large, then the answer is A. You don't have to try A. answer is A. You tried, you tried 3, it was too large. You tried 2, it was too large. Then A would have to be the answer. It's the only one left. And vice versa. The converse will also be true. If you try 3, and if it's too small, well, try 4. If 4 is still too small, the answer has to be the last one, E. Well, that's what we're going to do here, shall we? Let's try C. So we're going to pretend, we're going to pretend, we're just pretending, we have no way of knowing if it's the right answer, we do not know that. We're going to pretend that the prevailing price, the current price, is three dollars. And see if it fits in the jigsaw puzzle, shall we? All the pieces have to fit together. So if the current price is three dollars, then they tell us that N towels can be bought for one hundred and twenty dollars. N towels can be bought for $120. So if price is $3, then N has to be 120 times 3, which is 40. Of course, we can buy $40. We can buy we can buy 40 towels at $3 each, hence spending $120. They go on to tell, they go on to tell us, they go on to tell us that if you were to raise the price by a dollar, if you were to raise the price by a dollar, let's call it P0 and P1 for the new price. If you were to raise the price by a dollar, the new price would be four dollars. Well, at four dollars, at four dollars, how many towels do you suppose you can buy for one hundred and twenty dollars? For one hundred and twenty dollars, if the price is four dollars, we can only buy thirty towels. But there we go. Before we were able to buy forty towels, now we are able to buy only thirty towels. We are able to buy ten fewer towels. We are able to buy ten fewer can be bought for one hundred and twenty. It fits. We got lucky. It fits. The answer is C. We're done. The answer is C. That's it. As far as the real exam is concerned, this is how we will tackle it. This we are done. What we're going to do from this point on, for the next few minutes as a matter of fact, is purely for learning purposes to sharpen our skills, sharpen our math skills, or hone our math skill. But it's not for the real exam. It is not something I recommend doing in the real exam, which is we're going to actually do this problem algebraically. Just for learning purposes, we're going to do this problem algebraically. We're going to do this problem uh, academic, in, in a very academic way, in a conventional way, in an orthodox way, in a classical way. The way your math teacher would expect you to do it. Your math teacher would not buy that. But lucky for us, 
our math teacher is not grading this exam. Our, this exam is being, grade, being graded is by a bloody computer. Do you understand? A heartless, callous, bloody computer. He really doesn't give an F whether, whether you do this problem classically or whether you take a shortcut. We, all the computer cares about is that you circle the right circle, of course. You know what I'm talking about. I'm just pointing out the bloody obvious. Let's do it in a classical way, shall we? That is, we're done. The answer, answer has to be C because C fits. At $3, we can buy 40 towels. If you were to raise the price to $4, then we can buy only 30 towels. We can buy 10 fewer towels as a result of price having been risen from $3 to $4. It fits. Uh, we refer to this thing as P0. I, I want to get this out of my way here. This, this one we said P0. N-A-U-G-H-T. That's how we say it. P0. And we learned that word long time ago in our vocabulary lessons. In case you are interested in learning that word along with some other words, because it's not read, this thing is not read as P0. A lot of the times I hear people go around calling this thing P0. It is to be read as P0. Let's, let's do this problem in a classical way. But before we do that, I'm going to tell you when we just learn this word not. And when you watch that video, you're going to learn some other good words, synonyms and some other words, which are pronounced in some other, one, one other word, which is pronounced in a different way, but it's spelled in the exact same way, not. Day number 74. Vocabulary. Day 74. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words. Day number 74 and learn that. Uh, watch that video and learn that word. Are you ready to do this problem in a classical way? Let's do it. I need a lot of room, so we're going to start from the very beginning, okay? And this is only for those people who can broke it. This is only what we're about to do. What we're about to do. It's only for those people who can who can broke it. What does it mean to broke? To be able to broke something, it means to be able to tolerate it, to be able to handle it, to be able to to be able to endure it. If you can handle it, what we're about to do, if you can tolerate it, if you can endure it, then it's for you, otherwise it's not for you, if you cannot broke it. Because it is going to be algebra, obviously, which is why it's called the algebraic method. When did we learn about broke? I'm going to give you the day for that as well, for whatever is worth. Day number four, we learned it very, very early in the day four. Again, just type in vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day number four, and then you will learn the word. Let's begin. So we are told that if the price is P, we can buy n dollars. So P times n has to equal 120. This is 120. We are also told, so that's our first equation. We are also told that if you were to raise the price by one dollar, if price goes from P dollars, whatever the P dollars was for the price of the towel initially, if you were to raise the price by one more dollar, hence becoming P plus one, as a result of that, with that 120 dollars, we can only buy n minus 10 towels. We can buy 10 fewer towels. And that amount, this amount, this price times that amount has to equal same as $120. But $120 we know also equals P times N. Voila. Let's begin. Let's begin our process. Now I'm going to just do it. I'm not going to explain every excruciating detail, every excruciating steps. Because if I need to do that, then don't do the algebra. Do you understand? So here we go. P times N. P times negative 10 is negative 10P. N times 1 is just going to be N. And n times negative 10 is just going to be negative 10. And here we have p times n. p times n is going to cancel out with this p times n. And we end up with, again, I'm just going to take some shortcuts. Just sort of, just sort of bring it out. If you manipulate this thing, you'll find that n equals. Bring the 10 on that side and 10p on that side. So we'll end up with 10p minus, plus 10. 10p plus 10. Multiply both sides by p. Multiply both sides by p. And we know that this quantity now has to equal 120 because n times p because n times p equals 120. Are you with me? So we're multiplying both sides by p. Did we do that actually or did I mess it up already? I did mess it up already. This has to have a parenthesis around it. Okay? So we get p times 10p, which is going to be 10p squared, and then p times 10, which is going to be 10p, equals 120. Equals 120. But we're going to write this as, we can write this as minus 120 equals 0. There you go. Now we have our quadratic equation. We have our quadratic equation. 
This is 10p squared plus 10p minus 120. Everything is a multiple of 10. Let's divide the entire equation by 10. When we divide the entire equation by 10, we end up with p squared plus p minus 12 equals 120. Now we are looking for two numbers. Listen carefully. We are looking for two numbers so that when we multiply them, we get negative 12. And when we add them, we get positive 1. When we multiply them, we get negative 12. When we multiply them, four, positive 4 times negative 3, positive 4, po rather negative 4 times positive 3 is going to give us negative 12, and negative 4 times positive 3 is going to give us negative 1, which is what we're looking for. Oh, we're looking for positive 1 actually. It should be the other way around. Again, as I told you, I wasn't going to explain everything and I started doing it. Anyway, so let's do it here. And when you begin to explain every single st uh, step, that's where you get annoyed and you begin to make mistakes here. I'm just going to do it. So we need positive p, so we need positive 4p minus a 3p. Positive 4p and a minus 3p is going to give us a p. Minus 12 equals 0. And of course, positive 4p and a negative 3p is going to give us positive 4 times negative 3, which is negative 12. And p times p times p is p squared. You get negative 12p squared when we multiply positive 4p and a negative 3p. Let's continue this on the top. So we end up with p squared plus 4p minus 3p minus 12 equals 0. Let's take out p common from here. This thing and this thing has p. Common factor is p. Take it out common. So we get p plus 4. And from here and here, we have a common factor of negative 3. If we take out negative 3, we end up here with p. And negative 12 divided by negative 3 is going to give us positive 4. Now, we have this common, p plus 4, as a common quantity. p plus 4 is a common quantity between these two terms. Let's take it out common. p plus 4 comes out. And here we end up with p. And here we end up with negative 3 equals 0. We are almost done. I need the room. That's it. If this quantity times this quantity is equal to 0, that implies that either p plus 4 is equal to 0 or p minus 3 is equal to 0. If p plus 4 is equal to 0, then p would have to be negative 3. This is our, this, this would have to be negative 4. And that's our negative root. And or p would have to be positive 3. So we have a positive root and a negative 2 as we were expecting all along. But of course, since we are talking about the price of a towel, we are not interested in the negative root. The price of the towel is $3. But as you can see, none of that was necessary. None of that was absolutely necessary. Just back solve it, put the answer twice C in the problem, see if it fits. If it doesn't fit, if it doesn't fit, decide whether this, the price is too high or too low. Choose the directions and just go. You understand? Let's go to the next one. Number 204. Number 204. Number 204. Number 204, we are told that n equals 4 times p, where, where p is a prime number greater than 2. p cannot be any, any old number. It has to be a prime number. Not only it has to be a prime number, but we cannot pretend that p equals 2. It has to be greater than 2. So far, so good. What is, what is it that they're asking? What they're asking here, what the question is, how many, how many different, how many different, they're looking for distinct, how many different positive, even divisors does n have? How many different positive divisor does n have? Let's find out, shall we? First thing first, what does it mean, divisors? How many different positive, oh, positive, and it has to be even. It has to be positive, it has to be even. How many different positive, even divisor does n have? Well, what does divisor mean? Divisor is just a very annoying way, very awkward way, 
very fancy way of saying factors. Divisors are factors. What they're asking us here, what they're asking us here is how many different, how many different positive even factors does n have? It's very simple, very straightforward. All we have to do is just make up numbers. Make up, make up some prime numbers greater than two. Put it in this equation and see what happens. Let's begin our process. We know that n equals four times p. We, we are told that n equals four times p. We know that it has to be greater than two. It has to be greater than two, and it has to be a prime number. Can you think of a prime number greater than two? I can. Three. See how quick I am? So let's pretend that p is three. Three. It happens to be a prime number which is more than 2, in which case n would be 12. Now next we list, we list all the factors, all the factors of 12. Make sure you list all the factors of 12. And whenever, whenever somebody asks us to list all the factors of a given number, always make a habit of beginning your list with 1 and ending your list with the number itself. 1 is a factor of any number and a given number is a factor of itself. A number divided by itself is going to give us 1, so it divides immediately. So let's begin. Factors of 12 are 1, we can divide 12 by 1 evenly, 2, we can divide 12 by 2 evenly, 3, 3 is a factor of 12, 4, we can divide 12 by 4 evenly, 6, and finally the number itself. Finally the number itself. That's it, we are done. These are these are all the factors of 12. All we have to do now is to find out, is to ask ourselves how many of these factors that we have here of 12 are positive even numbers. Well, I see 2, that's positive and even. I see 4, that's an even number. I see 6, I see that's an even number. And I see 12. It turns out that there are 4, there are 4 positive even divisors of n. n has, if n equals to 12, if n happens to be 12, then it will have four positive even divisors. But what if n, what if n is not 12? What if n is something else? All you have to do is try one or two more times and see what happens. If the answer doesn't change, then that's what it is. Let's try one more time, shall we? And of course, the answer cannot change, obviously. answer cannot change, it will be silly. Because these are not data sufficiency questions. Do you understand? Data sufficiency questions for different animals. We are done with those questions. Those are very interesting questions. They make you think. Data sufficiency questions. And that's of course, that's where it might change because there the question is, do we have enough data just to answer the question yes or no? Here that's not the case obviously. Here it is 4. Of course it's going to be 4 when we try some other thing. Unless we made a mistake here. Let's find out, shall we? And we are told is 4 times p. And p has to be a prime number greater than 2. We already tried 3. We already tried 3. What's the next prime number that you can think of which is more than 2? Well, that will be 5. Or rather 3. Or oh, 3 is right here. That will be 5. So let's do five, 4 times 5 which is 20. Now let's list all the factors of 20. Factors of 20. I'm going to pick up speed now. 1, 2, 4, 5, I hope I don't miss something. 10 and 20. Did I leave out anything? I hope not. I bloody well hope not. 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 and 20. That's it. Those are all the factors. Those are the only numbers that you can divide 20 evenly by. And now we have to ask ourselves how many of them are even? 2 is even, 4 is even, 10 is even, 20 of even. What do you know? 4 again. Here we found there were four even factors of n. Here we find there are four even factors of n. I'm going to do it one more time, obviously, because, because we cannot just keep on going until we both turn 65. I'm going to do it one more time, and then we'll stop, okay? And you will see that it's going to be four again. It's going to be four again. Let's do it on the top. n equals 4 times p, 4 times, well we tried 3, we tried 5, let's try 7, that's 28, factors of 28, factors of 28. And of course for your own curious, curiosity, for, to satisfy your own curiosity and for your own learning purposes, 
it does not have to try for you for it does not hurt for you to try two more pro, two more uh, plug in two more prime numbers here and, and make sure that you get the same answer we tried seven here nine is not a prime number try 11 now on your own then try 13 and see what happens it's always answer is always going to be four and at the end of the, at the end of the problem I'm going to tell you why that is the case why is the answer always four I'll tell you at the end of the, at the end of the solution okay 28. So again, the factors of 28 are 1, 2, 1, 2, 3 is not a factor, 4, 6, no, 7, 14, and 28. And 28. And how many of them are even? How many of them are even. Well, let's find out, shall we? We have 2, we have 4, we have 14, and we have 28. We have 2, 4, 14, and 28. Again, 4. Why is the answer always 4? Why is the answer always 4? The answer is always going to be 4. Why? Because we have 2. Listen very clearly. Why? The answer, answer to that question is this. Because we have two even numbers here. 2 and 4. Always. 2 and 4. Right? And then what happens? You take those two even numbers, where does the 6 come from? 6 comes from 2 times 3. So that's your third one. And where does 12 come from? 12 comes from 3 times, 12 comes from 3 times 4. So we have two even numbers and a one prime number in between. We have two even numbers and then we have one prime numbers. We have one prime numbers and maybe we have two even numbers, 1 and 2. When we multiply that prime number by the first even number, you get a third even number. When you multiply that prime number by the second even number, you get your fourth even number. So there are always going to be four even factors. See? There's, 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 a, there's a prime number right here in the middle. When you multiply the prime number by the even number, you're going to get your third even number, 14. 2 times 7 is 14. And then you take your prime number and multiply it by the second even number, and you will get your fourth even number, even factor rather. The answer is always going to be 4. I'm not going to start number 205 right now. My plan was actually to do number 205. I'm not going to do it right now because I think the video has gotten to be very long already. Let's stop right here, okay? I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.